Father's Day, 1995, an evangelist named Steve Hill was invited here to Brownsville Assembly of God for one Sunday morning service. What took place that morning would eventually not just change this church, but over three and a half million lives. Over 150,000 souls would be reborn in the revival that would take place here. You see, when Steve came, he shared that morning, I will remember the wonders of the Lord. He had just gotten back from the UK where he had received a powerful touch from Jesus. And as he was sharing about what the Lord was doing in his life, he then invited the church to come into the altar if they wanted a fresh touch from Jesus. That morning, 1,800 people were here at the church. Nearly half came down. As Steve began to lay hands on him and he just prayed in a simple prayer, touch more, fire, the power of God began to go through them. Oh, many of them, they had radical encounters with Jesus. The senior pastor, John Kilpatrick, was observing this from the platform. Oh, he was overwhelmed with what he was seeing beginning to take place in his people. He stepped down off the stage into the altar area to assist Steve. But when he came down into the altar area, he began to notice something was happening in the church. He said he felt like there was something swirling around his feet. At first, he thought it might be the air conditioner was broken, but he noticed it was difficult for him to move, almost as if he was wading through the water. He then heard what he described as a sound, as if wind was being blown across the microphone. He thought it was coming from the speaker cluster above his head, but as he looked up, he noticed the sound wasn't coming from there. It was coming from behind him, the back of the sanctuary. As he looked back in his mind's eye, he could see as almost a window in heaven opened up and this flood of water just kind of entered into the church. It hit the stage, cascading down the steps. It came right between his legs, nearly knocking him over. Usher came to their pastor to help assist because they noticed he was struggling. He has to go to the pulpit. He picks up the microphone. His intention is to address the people and let them know everything is okay, that what's happening is the answer to over a year and a half's worth of prayer. You see, this church had prayed for revival for a year and a half. Oh, they could have never known that that year and a half's worth of prayer was about to be answered that morning. As the pastor took the microphone, he addressed the people by saying, church, this is what we've been praying for. Get in. And at that moment, at 12.01 on Father's Day, 1995, as the federal headship welcomed the move of God, the glory of the Lord just descended into the sanctuary. Oh, dozens and dozens of people began to get hit by the power of God across the church. In fact, their senior pastor, John Kilpatrick, as he was coming back down the steps, was overwhelmed by the power of the Lord, and he collapsed to the stage, his head hitting the ground where he would stay there for some time. Oh, that service was supposed to be over at noon, but many people, they were leaving the church as the sun was coming back up the next day. They added another service, and then another service, and they continued to add them. That revival lasted for five years. Years. Oh, there were times that people would come and they would line up outside here at the church. Sometimes thousands at a time arriving as early as six o'clock in the morning to get into a church where the doors wouldn't open up until six o'clock that night. They came because they were hungry for more. My friend, that was the prayer during the revival, more. And I have good news for you, that no matter where you're at with the Lord, there's more. I promise you that he's always ready to be able to visit those who are hungry and thirsty for more. He says, come to me and I'll give you rest. Come to me and ask for water and I will give you a spring that wells up to eternal life. He's the one who promises abundant life. So I promise you, my friend, there's always more. So God, we ask the same thing. <laughs> God, we ask for more, right? We've been praying. I, I couldn't tell you the time stamp on how long we've been praying for revival, but we're praying. We're asking the Lord the same things. We're asking him to come. We're asking him um, to change lives, to pour out his spirit, and not just for an experience, not just for me and you to feel good, but for complete transformation, for complete change, for families to be touched, for communities, schools, this entire community, lives would be changed. And all glory to the Lord. Amen. Amen. I can't wait to say the same thing that pastor says. 
Today is the day we've been praying for. Woo! Man, today is the day. But until then, as we continue to pray, as we continue to be faithful to his word and what he's called us to do, we carry on. How many were here last Sunday or watched the video um, last Sunday with Pastor Johan? That was an awesome time. If you um, didn't get a chance to watch that video uh, or, or hear the message, I highly recommend that you go back. Uh, friends online, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, it's been an action-packed service already. This is exciting. <laughs> uh, but Pastor Johan was here, and he did an amazing job, did he not? Uh, just the way he, he shared his, his heart and his message. And he, he continued on with us as we um, study and go through the book of John. He was right there with us. And I don't know about you, but I came out of that message saying to myself, I need a grandpa. <laughs> I, just, I, I need a grandpa. My wife needs a grandpa. My kids need a grandpa. His message, if you weren't here, was, was titled The Wisdom of a, of a Grandfather. And it was in perspective of how um, the Apostle John, in his later age, continues to speak, encourage, and teach the church. And, I, and as he was speaking, I, I, I thought about how he referenced Paul versus Grandpa John, and how Grandpa John comes with this wisdom of a grandfather, this love of a grandfather, while Paul is just direct law. This is how you do it. Do it on this time, on this date. And I was like, man, I'm more of a Paul than I am a John when it comes to directing my children. You know what I mean? Like every command, every discipline for me is something more direct. And my kids, they don't have the grandparents that are around enough to come around them and share storied life lessons. They, they have grandparents. They live in California. The other set live in Missouri, so we don't get to see them often. So I'm praying over it. You know, we'll see what God does. Rachel and I will be taking applications at the end of service. <laughs> Feel free to see us. Uh, we're hiring <laughs> applicants so you can apply online. Same thing. <laughs> uh, seriously, though. Uh, <laughs> But for me, I didn't, I didn't grow up with grandparents either. Um, my grandparents were in the Philippines and had passed away prior to me uh, coming to this earth. <laughs> but the closest thing that I had to grandparents were my senior pastors in California. Their names are Pastor Mike and Pastor Marie Cantwell. You'll hear me from time to time share about them here on this pulpit. But they, they did life with me. And I'm not talking about just on Sundays. They really did life with me. And they shared stories, stories about their life, stories like the one just Jeff shared up here. Uh, Jeff, when you were sharing that story, it was like, it was like I was there with you. Like I just was brought into another place, and I was like, man, what an experience. But they shared their hurts. They shared their triumphs. They shared lessons, and they offered resolve. And it wasn't just a checklist, right? But they were active in my life. And Jesus was a part of everything, and it was evident. I watched them as they lived out their life loving and serving the Lord. And the cool thing about this whole thing is that they invited me in. I was a very young believer. I was like 19 years old. I'll forever be grateful to them. When I met Rachel for the first time, uh, the first people that I wanted her, her to meet in my life were my parents and Pastor Mike and Pastor Marie Cantwell. And I think I've shared this before. If I haven't, it's not embarrassing anymore. Pastor Marie, she, uh, she was from France, and she did the whole kissing thing. That's how she greets people. And uh, she had a very special nickname for me. And nobody else can call me this except for her. And that's how I know we have a tight relationship. But she'll give me a kiss on the cheek. And she goes, my petunia. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, okay. At first I was just looking around. I was like, who is this lady? <laughs> but it started like that. That was how we started our relationship. And that's how it continues today. You could call her on the phone and she could 
you hear her because she's loud. Petunia! <laughs> it's sweet, man. Grandparents are awesome. <laughs> But as we continue on, if you have your Bibles, we are going to start where Pastor Johan left off in 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. We're going to go all the way through 27 today, and the title of my message is Faith Unwavering. Faith Unwavering. I'll grab my water bottle here. That's cool. We're, we're on the water theme. I love the ocean. I hate sharks, but I love the ocean. Let's start. Verse 18, this is John speaking to the early church. He says, Dear children, this is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. They went out from us but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us, but their going showed that none of them belonged to us. Let's break this down a little bit. When John speaks of the Antichrist here, John is warning the church that there are many Antichrists who have come and will come. The word Antichrist is a combination of two Greek words. First one, anti means instead of or against. And Christo, which means the anointed one, Christ, the anointed one. Antichrist means those who seek to take the place of the true Christ, those who seek to take the place of Jesus. John here suggests that there are many Antichrists that have come, meaning many false teachers, many false prophets, that these false teachers have the spirit of the Antichrist. The spirit of the Antichrist is a deceptive and hostile force, one that opposes the truth of Jesus Christ and seeks to undermine the gospel. It's a spirit of rebellion, rebellion against God, and here, the denial of his son. John continues to talk about that as we, we carry on. John also references the last hour. The last hour is often referenced to the last hour before the second coming of Jesus. Even back then, people believed that Jesus was returning soon. But what does it say? What does it say in Revelation 22.20? In bright red text, it says, as Jesus speaking, Yes, I am coming soon. Jesus says this at the end of Revelations. Yes, I am coming soon. And this was understood in the most literal sense, that he's coming back. And what does he say? He's coming back soon. That's how that was to be believed. He's coming back. And at the same time, we know that in Mark 13, 32, 33, it says this. Now, no one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on your guard and stay alert, for you do not know when the appointed time will come. Right? It's this paradox. But we know. We know he's coming. We know he's coming soon. We know there will be a time when Jesus returns. And if you think about it, what prophet who is inspired by these scriptures wouldn't say that the last hour is near? Right? It should really be more said, when is it not near? Jesus' return is more than an idea, more than an if. It's a matter of when. And then when John says, they went out from us, John emphasizes that those who have left the community of believers were never truly part of it. Because if they were, they would have stayed, right? I'm reminded when Jesus was talking to the Jewish people in John 8.31. If you guys could turn there. In John 8.31, this is Jesus speaking to the Jewish people and some Pharisees. Jesus says to them, If you hold to my teaching, 
you are really my disciples, then you will know the truth. Can you guys finish this with me? And the truth will set you free. There's powerful verses in here. I recommend that you go back. He talks about how everyone who sins is a slave to sin. And if the Son sets you free, he frees you indeed. But here Jesus states his position as being sent by God and as the Son of God. And the Pharisees argued, right? They were saying, you're not the one. They were saying to Jesus, God is our Father. We are not illegitimate, illegitimate children. They're saying they're directly connected. And when they told Jesus that they weren't illegitimate, illegitimate why can't I say that word? <laughs> Woo! Just help me out. Can I hear you say it? Uh, that's, not, that's not helping. <laughs> Woo! Um, when the Pharisees said that to Jesus... Um, not only were they saying they're directly connected to God, but that was a diss uh, and, and gossip on how Mary and, J- and Joseph conceived, you know what I mean? How Jesus was bro- uh, born of a virgin birth. They were saying, we're not illegitimate. They argued that with Jesus. And how did Jesus answer? He says in John eight forty two and 44, If God were your father, you would love me, for I have come here from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. In verse 44, he says, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. The Pharisees, you guys, they had a belief in God, but they had no part of him. These false teachers John is talking about are the ones who left and those that are promoting a false doctrine and leading people astray. That's what he's talking about here in these letters. Even though they had an association, they weren't genuine believers of the faith. John's concern here is their impact on the community of believers, the church, and warns them of the danger of following their teachings. And you guys, this is an important reminder of the church to remain faithful to the end, to the very end, even in the face of opposition, faithful to the gospel, faithful in following Jesus, faith that's unwavering. Let's continue on. Verses 20 and 21. John says to the church, but you have an anointing from the Holy One. And all of you know the truth. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. John is saying here to the church, you know the truth. You got it. It's with you. You know it. He's encouraging you, right? Just like a grandpa. You know this. You got this saying any teaching that says salvation is found in any other place or person outside of Jesus is a lie. John hits on this false claim, I talked about this earlier on, of the secret knowledge that leads to salvation. There was this teaching saying, there's a secret knowledge, only a few people know it. That's how you get salvation, that's how you get to God. But John is saying here, it's no secret. It's public record. It's Jesus alone. It's Jesus alone that we receive salvation. And here too, I thought it was cool as I was digging and studying. When John talks about the anointing, the anointing here is a reference to the Holy Spirit. John is saying that you have the anointing of the Holy Spirit The anointing or the unction is the protection that believers have against false teaching and false teachers. The Holy Spirit will help you discern the truth from falsehoods. The anointing is a gift from God and essential in recognizing and discerning false teachings, false doctrine. This anointing leads us. It leads us in having unwavering faith. I did a, 
a little devotion. We send them out every Tuesday. If you're not on our email list, come see Rachel, Joy, and myself. We can get you on that email. <laughs> but we send out a devotion every Tuesday. And the one that I did a couple Tuesdays ago was regarding praying, listening, discerning, and then going. Right? These are spiritual practices we have as we pray, as we listen to God's voice, listen to the Holy Spirit, the unctioning of the Holy Spirit. And then we discern. We push away all of our, our own thoughts, all of our worldly thoughts, all of these things that come and distract us and, and try to hit us on every side. And we discern for the voice of the Holy Spirit. And after that, we go. Okay, God, what it is you want me to do? Thank you for sharing that with me. Thank you for teaching me. Thank you for filling me up. Now what do I do with that? How do I go? This is the unctioning of the Holy Spirit. This is how the Holy Spirit works in our lives. And this is what John is saying. You have that. You have that anointing. It's with you, and it's with you now. With these false teachers around us, that's what you need to go to. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's keep going. Verses 22 to 23. John says, Who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son and has the Father, whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Here, John speaks on the importance of believing that Jesus is, is the Son of God. We know Jesus is the only way to have a relationship with God, right? Jesus came and he made a way for that, for us, to have a relationship with God. I like to say that Jesus created the greatest bridge ever known. Jesus built this bridge for us, that we may cross it and have a true relationship with God, the Father himself. Jesus also made the greatest exchange. He gave his life for us. Amen. Jesus gave his life in exchange for ours. When John talks about denying here, denying that Jesus came in the flesh is to deny his status as the anointed one. There was also a question going around that Jesus wasn't really man, that Jesus wasn't really a human, but Jesus came as some divine being, and that's all he was. He wasn't really man. All right, and that was confusing to the early church because why? We know Jesus as what? Fully God and fully man. He took on human flesh to dwell among us. Turn with me to Philippians 2, 6 through 8. Philippians 2, 6 through 8. It says, Who, being in very nature a God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death and even death on a cross. You guys, a person cannot worship God while denying Jesus' full deity and full humanity as well. As believers, we acknowledge and put our faith in Jesus. We put our faith in Jesus being the Son of God, being sent from the Father, that he came in human flesh, that he was born of a virgin birth, that he came to fulfill the law, that his body was broken, his blood was spilled, that he conquered death and overcame the grave. He bore the sins of the world. He ascended to heaven, sits on the right hand of God, and he came in love and for forgiveness for all. Amen? Turn with me to verses 24 to 27 of 1 John. says, as for you, 
See that, you, see that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you also will remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is what he promised us. This is great. Eternal life. Verse 26. I am writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. As for you, the anointing you received from him remains in you. And you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as the anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, close as it here, remain in him. John closes here with with encouraging the people to abide in what they have already received from the beginning with the promise that the following of truths will keep you in fellowship with God and fellowship with one another, that eternal life is yours as you reside in him. Like a grandfather who comes with wisdom and experience, somebody who's seen it all, John is saying, I'm writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray, saying, I'm showing you a way that will lead you to God, the way, because I know the other roads. I've seen where they go. I've seen what happens. I know the results. I I know the outcomes. I've seen the destruction. He says, allow the Holy Spirit to teach you. When he says the anointing here, and that you have that, that you don't need any other teachers, he says, allow the Holy Spirit to teach you, to guide you, The anointing you received from him remains in you. It says that God's Holy Spirit is in you and it's it's real. It's not counterfeit, he says. That you can trust in it. That it won't ever lead you astray. The Holy Spirit is not a false teacher, amen? The Holy Spirit is from the Father. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. And that resides in you. That's yours. That's for you. And then he says, if you remain in him. He says that four times between verses 24 and 27. So in other words, he's saying, keep the faith. Keep the faith. Hold on tight to that. Don't waver in relationship with God. This next part here. Lately, I've watched a lot of documentaries. Sometimes I'll watch a documentary that my wife will be like, nope, I'm not going to watch that with you. (laughs) Nope, that's a little too much for me. And I just get hooked, you know. I'm so curious about things of the past, things that happened when I was a kid, things that happened before I was born, um, and people documenting it hearing testimonies and different perspectives. Um, I think it was in the early 90s. Does anybody remember what happened in Waco regarding the Branch Davidians? Yeah, it was really intense. Really intense. And I think about what happened there. I think about false teaching, false doctrine, people being hurt, people being misled, and it ending in this destruction, right? More recently, I had a conversation with somebody at work. Um, Anybody used to watch the Bill Cosby show? Yeah. Yeah. America loved Bill Cosby. Remember what they used to say about him? He had the cleanest stand-up comedy that we've ever enjoyed and had the benefit of sitting down and watching. His, his morals on family and life should run for president. And as we know it now, that cleanliness that he showed on the outside did not represent who he was on the inside. False teachers, false doctrines all around. Might be a religion, might be an influence, 
It might be your neighbor. It might be things that we've grown up with thinking that this is okay just because that's all I know. That's all I'm with. But my charge for you today is not to waver in your relationship with God, to not allow the deception of man and the fear of man, the spirit of pride and self-justification take dominion and territory in your life. Don't get me wrong, this stuff is all around us and we deal with it every single day. We battle it daily. But like I said, my charge today is to not allow it in. Don't allow it to reside in your hearts and in your minds. Don't let false teachers influence you. John is saying, let the things of the Spirit be dealt with the Spirit. When he says you don't need a teacher, he's not saying it's it's, it's bad to have a mentor or a person you look up to. He's saying, allow the things of the Spirit to be dealt with, with the Spirit. Is something clouding your judgment? Do you feel darkness around you? Are you you feeling unsure of something? Are you going to the Lord with something? Allow the Spirit to deal with that in you. That's That's what John's calling out today. Don't let anything cloud your view on who the true Christ is. If the crowd is going one direction and God tells you to go the other, allow the Holy Spirit to guide you. Don't make herd decisions, but make godly ones. Amen? Faith and obedience in things of God over fear of man. If you're into Christian hip-hop, there is a saying and something they often reference in their music. And they say these three letters, G-O-E, God over everything. God over everything. We know pride comes before the fall, right? Who likes being right? It's okay. Who likes winning arguments? It's okay. <laughs> Who likes it when somebody says that you can't do something and so you do it just so you can throw it in their face? (laughs) Oh, man. What now? We want to know that what we are doing and what we stand for is the right thing all the time, right? It's our nature. I don't want to be wrong. We have a deep desire to be justified. You see that in our roots as a country, where we came from, what we fled from. You can look at it now. Everybody who has a set of standards or beliefs waving their flag saying, I am right. And if you think that I am wrong, then you are the worst person in the world. And everything from you should be stripped and should never be allowed to live. We want to be justified. But as believers, answer me this. Justification belongs to who? Amen. Justification belongs to the Lord. None of us are righteous. None of us can justify ourselves. Romans 3.20 says this. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes Knowledge of sin. Continuing on, Galatians 5.4 says this, You who are trying to be justified by the law have been severed from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. You hear those scriptures. You see that it's true. And then Jesus comes in. In Romans 5, 9 through 10. It says, since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him, him being Jesus? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled shall we be saved through his life? 
the only justification, the only make right, the only hope is his blood. We stand on grace, and it's Jesus alone. Amen? Don't allow pride in, you guys. This, this nature that we have to be justified, self-justified. Don't allow pride in. Don't allow the sin to take over, to harden your hearts and keep you away from God. That last scripture said you are severed from Christ. Man, this, this, this sin that's carried on of pride can do that kind of damage to you. Instead, it's Jesus. It's grace upon grace. Remain in him. Allow the anointing of his spirit in your life to guide you, to direct and teach you. The call to the early church is still the call to the church today. It's relevant. It's real. We've seen it. We work through it. And we continue to pray through it. And we remain strong in him. Amen. Joe, you want to come up? I want to close with this before we go into communion. You guys don't have to get communion just yet. You guys enjoying our first John study? Yeah, cool. But I want to close with this. And think about John and him writing these letters to the church, saying things like, remain in him, trust in him he's the only way look to Jesus don't forget who you are and I'm reminded of God's altar and at God's altar there's a flame in Leviticus 6.13 God gives Moses these directions he says The fire must be kept burning on the altar continuously. It must not go out. These are directions given to Moses regarding burnt offerings in the time of the Old Testament. He's saying, don't ever let that fire go out. There's a fire that's supposed to stay on this altar. Stay on this altar as you give offerings a fire that's supposed to stay lit. This is directions directly from God. If we think of a perpetual fire, what do you guys think of? How about when God appeared to Moses in flames of a fire in a burning bush? The bush was on fire, but what? But it never burnt up. He also appeared as a pillar of fire at night to lead the Israelites, right? And now in Leviticus, the law came saying, outside of the tabernacle, the fire for the burnt offering was consumed and it was commanded to be kept burning. Never was it to be extinguished. And the reason why this is important to note and why I'm saying this to you today is that that fire was directly started from God. Nobody else. It's not man-made. In Leviticus 9.24, it says, Fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed the burnt offering, the fat portions on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted for joy and fell face down. Can you imagine? You were... You were told, you were commanded, say, build this altar, build the altar of the Lord. Build it here. Put the burnt offerings there. And you weren't instructed to light it. You weren't instructed to be a part of this process and ceremony that brings the presence of the Lord down. But God himself, Scripture itself says, fire came from the Lord and it burnt and it stayed lit. The fire on the altar served as a constant reminder of God's power. That it was a gift from heaven. 
that there was no other source of fire that was acceptable. People found joy and at the same time found reference, uh, reverence in this. Excuse me. When John refers to the truth that was given to you at the beginning, remember the fire on God's altar, that it can never be extinguished, that it burns up all of our sin, all of our rubbish, all of our shortcomings, all of the lies, and it returns to us hope, and it represents God's power in our life. There's no other source acceptable, right? I don't need fire from this place. I don't need fire from that person. But it's God's. And that fire that burns, you guys, belongs to you. That's your fire, amen? Why don't you guys stand with me? If you, uh, if you guys want to get communion ready, I'm going to pray here. If you're a guest in this place, communion is also for you. All I ask is that you, like the Bible says, examine your hearts. Allow God to to do a check in your heart where you're at. Give to the Lord what needs to be given. Repent where you need to repent. Lay it all down for the Lord as we come to his communion table, as we come and we acknowledge what Jesus did on the cross. Father, I thank you so much for today. I thank you for this congregation, Lord. And I thank you for your word. I thank you that the same, the same encouragement, the same, the same word to the early church is the same for us. That we would remain in you. That we trust in your Holy Spirit and that we push away anything that's not of you, God. God, continue growing us, continue teaching us through your Holy Spirit. And God, today we choose to acknowledge your goodness, your sacrifice, and your love through communion. In Jesus' name, well said, amen. Why don't you guys come up and receive communion? You know, we used to take communion like once a month. And then we switched it up after we went through something pretty traumatic as a church. And we did that, you know, there's many reasons. But we did that because we wanted to be so close to God. We did that because we had such a need. And there was pain. What this represents here, and as we do it as a family, you guys, it's not a sorrow thing. It's not something where we're downcast, but it's something, it's something of joy. It's something that represents God's heart. It's something that He asked us to do every time we remember Him. Every time, every time we think about His sacrifice. Every time we think about the cross. He says to do it together. Amen. So let's read. For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, 
This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. God, we love you so much. We thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for the cross. We thank you that you went up there willingly with all of us in mind, that you would take away all of our sins so that we might have relationship with you, so that we might have eternal life forever and ever. And God, you ask in return our life and we give it to you. We surrender it all. We ask that you have your way and we take joy. We take joy in your love for us and your guidance and your Holy Spirit. Let's take together. God, I pray blessings over everybody here, everybody watching online. Pray that uh, you would be with us for the rest of the week, God. Speak to us. Give us divine appointments. Holy Spirit, continue leading us. We trust you and we love you. In Jesus' name we all said, Amen. amen. Have a great week, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you for joining us. Love you guys. See you guys next time. Love you too. Woo, thank you. Bye, friends online. Thank you so much for tuning in to the original Fuel Church YouTube and being a part of what we're doing here at Fuel. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. If you enjoyed what you heard today, share it with a friend. And if you'd like to support Fuel and Fuel International, information to do so will be in the description below. Have an awesome day. I look forward to seeing you soon.